to our weekly discussion group. This week we are going to try a little experiment with voice radio. I have a feeling this technology is really going to change the world when the Great War is over. As we speak, students are standing by at the College of the Sacred Heart in North Denver with a radio receiver, waiting to hear the sound of our voices. We have already established a telephone connection so the students can confirm that they are hearing us. This ought to be a very interesting experiment. Senator Shafroth, would you mind flipping that switch? College of the Sacred Heart students, can you hear us? Hear us. Well, hear us. that's fantastic. Then let's get started. First of all, we should all introduce ourselves to our newly confirmed radio audience. As they know, I am Father John Brown, president of the College of the Sacred Heart, a small Jesuit college in North Denver. We've recently bought two, brought two schools together, and while we are not known, though we are now known as the College of the Sacred Heart, my fellow Jesuits and I have been learning more about the Jesuit Saint Saint John Francis Regis of France. He's an interesting fellow. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear more about him in the years to come. Let's go around the table. Please introduce yourself. Well, I am Nell Campbell Ross O'Brien, but all of you wonderful Denverites know me as Polly Cry, the famous reporter. I started out at the New York World, moved here to Colorado 20 years ago when my family had tuberculosis, immediately got a job at the Denver Post, broke the fabulous story about Alfred Packer being innocent. As thanks for that, I had to protect my two bosses when they were being shot by Alfred Packer's horrifying attorney, Pughead Anderson. And then as thanks for that, they later fired me for exposing union corruption. When I started my own newspaper, if you can imagine a woman having a newspaper in Denver. Moved back to New York, came back here, now I'm working with the Denver Times, I've been in France, I interviewed Panchevia, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you. We are thrilled to have you here. sir. I am John Shafroth, the uh, United States Democratic Senator for Colorado. Uh, before that, I was the only man ever elected to two consecutive terms as governor of Colorado. And in, in that time, we got through the key progressive reforms to improve our democracy. <coughs> Excuse me. Initiative, referendum, recall, direct election of senators, and uh, direct primaries. And before that, I was in the United States House of Representatives, uh, representing the Denver area for 10 years. And I got the nickname Honest John because in 1904, I, I resigned after it became clear that my close election that year uh, only came about because of election fraud that had been perpetrated by the Denver machine. And sir, please introduce yourself to our radio audience. Well, I will. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, John C. Schaefer, I moved here just a few years ago, but uh, I uh, went to Chicago as a young man and made my fortune at the Board of Trade in Grain Futures and uh, helped develop the Chicago streetcar system, built streetcars in Indianapolis and other cities. Then I got into newspapers, and as Ms. Pry knows well, I uh, got the Chicago Evening Post, the Indianapolis Star, the, the uh, Terre Haute Star, Muncie, Indiana, Frankfurt, uh, Kentucky. And uh, I had a son out here, Kent. He came out and invited me for a visit. Uh, enjoyed it very much. I love the weather out here. So I went to uh, former Senator Patterson and I bought me the uh, Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Times. So Miss Pry is an employee of mine and we're very proud to have her. I like Colorado so much that in addition to my house in Evanston, Illinois, I have bought the ranch down in Jefferson County, southwest of, uh, of the city of Denver and I've named it after my two sons, Kent and Carol. We call it the Ken Carroll Ranch. Sounds like a fine name for a fine place. It's a wonderful place. And ma'am, please introduce yourself for our radio audience. I'm Emily Griffith, and like so many people at this table, I came to Denver as well and have stayed and made my livelihood here. In particular, last year I had the chance to open a school because education is my passion, and particularly making sure that everyone has access to education. My school offers free classes at night to adults where they can learn skills and trades and will help them have a better livelihood and be able to raise their families more effectively. 
Um, we thought there would be a lot of interest in this school. We thought maybe we'd get 200 adults in the first year. In the first week, we got 1,400 students, which says so much about what needs to happen in Denver today. As a fellow educator, I could, I very much agree. Let's get to the program. Well, I would like to share with all of you, I'd like to share all of your interesting views on these very important issues as we face now here in 1917. A Colorado legend passed away this January, William F. Cody, better known as Wild West legend Buffalo Bill. Cody began his career with the Pony Express in the days before the Telegraph. Coloradans joined the world by paying grand tribute to Cody as an estimated 18,000 people filed past the body as it lay in state at the Capitol Rotunda. A grand ceremony with full Masonic rites was held at his interment on Lookout Mountain on June 3rd. Ms. Pry, what did you think of this epic entertainer of the West? Well, you know, at one point, and it was when I moved here in the late 90s, William F. Cody was the most famous man in the world. He took his show everywhere around the, around the globe. Wonderful man, famous. He was taken advantage of by the Denver Post when they owned his show here. He passed away in January, actually, at his sister's in the Five Points neighborhood. But he wanted to be buried on Lookout Mountain. And because the ground was frozen, they had to put him on hold until they were finally able to bury him in June. It was an incredible service. I covered it. I'm sure all of you were there. But we had to watch out because the bad people of Cody, Wyoming, were trying to steal his body. He had founded Cody, of course, but he wanted to be buried in Colorado, not in Wyoming. It was good. There was strong security. I think it was Olinger Mortuary is where he was uh, arrested until he was buried at the Lookout Mountain. Senator Shafroth, what did you think of a man who embodied the, the Western era as an entertainer and experiencing things like the Pony Express and the Wild West? And now his, his, him and the era seems to come to an end. Well, I, I'd put his life in, in two halves. There was the, the Wild West show that he started in 1883. Of course, was very successful. Not exciting, not, not especially realistic, but he, he was smart enough, I guess, to start his kind of fantasy Wild West show at a time when there, there wasn't really many realistic, uh, much demand for realistic dramas or, or novels. And, and so he, he fit the era then. But more importantly to me, he's one of the, what he really did, not on stage, Coloradans owe him a tremendous debt. He was an outstanding scout. And it was his scouting that helped the, that was the reason that the U.S. Army was able to track down and find and fight the Cheyennes led by Tall Bull at the Battle of Summit Springs in July 1869. And that battle was what finally broke uh, the Cheyenne attacks on our territory, which have been going on uh, for most of the decades. So we, we owe him a lot. Mr. Schaefer, we see somebody who knew the Pony Express, and now, of mm -hmm. course, so many things have changed in the way we communicate. I couldn't imagine this kind of change has happened over anyone else's lifetime. Your thoughts on Buffalo Bill Cody? Well, I'll tell you, right, things have changed because, as you know now, at newspapers we have wires, you know, telegraph wires, and we get our news that way now. But uh, old Buffalo Bill, of course, was a friend of ours, and uh, I think a lot of people don't really focus in, other than his big public image, larger than life, they don't focus in on his heritage, which is very solid Republican. He came from anti-slavery stock. His dad, in fact, gave his life in the cause of anti-slavery. And uh, Buffalo Bill, as a young man, had to ride out and warn him of an ambush when they were living in Kansas. And the Kansas slavery boys were out to get him. And so I want people to remember that. And for that reason, I will have our newspapers oppose these rumors we hear in Congress that there uh, may be an attempt to strip the scouts who had received the, the Medal of Honor, uh, strip them of that title when they've redefined who can achieve a Congressional Medal of Honor. They're going to restrict it just to the enlisted personnel and officers. I think that's a disgrace. I don't want to see that happen, not to Buffalo Bill and not to any of the other half dozen or so scouts who earned this honor. He was a good Catholic as well, as the Knights of Columbus had attended his burial on Lookout Mountain. Yes, he was. Ms. Griffith, what should your students and the students at the College of Sacred Heart remember about Buffalo Bill mm -hmm. Cody? I think one of the best things about him is his ambition. A man with a grand plan or a woman with a grand plan is a marvelous thing. It's how this country has been become what it has become. And I think for my students, anything that encourages them to think that big is great. I think his legacy is, is honed in, yes, his grand shows that may or may not have been true, but taught people about what the West was or gave them an idea of it. And we look at the people pouring into our communities now, many of whom are my students. They're here because of part of what he created, part of what he showed them about the West. 
After watching the European powers slaughter each other for two and a half years, the United States has joined the great struggle over there. Revelations in the Zimmerman telegram helped to finally force Congress into letting President Wilson arm our merchant vessels, making war with the Kaiser inevitable. The Zimmerman telegram has a resonance with the, for the people of this state. The Kaiser promised to give two-thirds of the state of Colorado to Mexico in exchange for a successful alliance. The war has brought an unexpected benefit and challenge to Colorado's economy. The new queen of state agriculture is the sugar beet. However, due to the war, the beet growers can no longer get new German immigrants to farm the beets for them. Passage of the Immigration Act this year means we cannot look to Asia to replace our farm labor either. Senator Shafroth, these are big issues for Colorado and the entire country. Your thoughts? Well, I voted for the war, and Representative Keating from Pueblo voted against it, and he correctly said when congressmen vote for a war, that doesn't mean they go to the front. That's true. But all three of my able-bodied sons are fighting. They're, uh, one of them is career Navy, and the other two are are in our armed forces right now, so I, I, I feel the terrible danger that, that everybody does about that their children dying in combat. And so we, this needs to be the war to end war, as others have said, and needs to, when it ends, we need to create a permanent world court of arbitration to pre prevent future conflicts from, from getting out of control. But while that war is going on, there's something important. My father came from Switzerland, and he spoke German. I read into the congressional record a letter from Denver's Godfrey Shermer, the founder of the German American Bank, the German National Bank here. Um, and he talked about the loyalty of German Americans. So let's not have any, let's make a distinction between fighting the German army and the Kaiser versus the good American citizens who come from Germany. We're not getting a lot of big army bases out of this war, it appears, but I'm fighting in Congress so we can get a tuberculosis recuperation hospital for army personnel uh, somewhere in the, the Denver area, for which it would be perfect. You, you talked about the sugar program problem. I was against the Philippine annexation, um, among many other reasons, would be the competition that Colorado growers are now facing from Philippine sugar, and what you talked about is going to make it even worse. You know, normally we, we might in, invite Mexicans to come up as, as seasonal laborers, but with all the craziness of General Carranza and the working with Germany to take two-thirds of our state away from us, maybe we can't do that. So let me give you another idea. I'm the chairman of the Committee on Puerto Rico and the Pacific Islands, and last year I got through Congress the jones Shafroff Act, which extended American citizenship to Puerto Ricans and let them have their own legislature. So now that they're citizens, maybe they can come to Colorado and help us with our crops. That's an interesting idea. Mr. Schaefer, what do you think now that the, the war effort is on, just when we need sugar beets, we have this problem in Colorado? Any solutions, any thoughts? Well, I think that problem is exacerbated by the fact that uh, of the 16 or so percent of our population that is foreign-born, far and away, the single most dominant category is those from German uh, descent and, and from Austria. And uh, they outnumber the English and the Scots by, by a long shot. And that's, that's much of your labor in the sugar beet field. So I, I want to agree with the senator about how we need to remember that we're not fighting the German people who have chosen to come to America and make this their home and make a better life. We're fighting those countries. As far as the Immigration Act, if, if I can swing over to that for a second, I find it ironic that it's aimed only at the races from Asia primarily from the races, uh, to the races in Asia. And, uh, and I found it ironic that they chose the verbiage that they did, that they wanted to limit the admission of idiots, imbeciles, and the feeble-minded. And I want to say, if you look among your native-born already, you might say it's a bit too late for that. That door seems to right? have left the barn, hasn't it? But, but I, do th I do think that the war is, is, is an opportunity, as the senator pointed out, to promote the Colorado economy, not, and not just in agriculture, but in mining. I know that there's some talk, and the senator has brought it up himself, of reviving the silver industry, for example. Uh, there, there's great opportunity here. The hospital that's being searched for, I know people from the, from the uh, business community, from the chamber here, are scouting locations for a new hospital because of the chemical attacks that the Germans are launching on the uh, Western Front. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to latch onto this opportunity. It's going to be a very good time in Colorado to increase our national exposure. Ms. Griffith, what do you think about Colorado's role, especially as the United States joins the Great War in Germany? 
Well, opportunity is, is the word of the day, apparently. It seems that Colorado right now might be poised to really take advantage of this, to create some jobs, to bring industry to the, this state. Um, and as we do, my school will be prepared to train workers for those, those particular fields. But in, in, before we can even speak about that, I, I have to take so much uh, just concern about the wording of the Immigration Act, as it was pointed out. But one of the concepts is actually a literacy test which mm -hmm. seems like an impossible thing for so many of our new citizens to achieve. How can we expect them to pass a test when we haven't taught them? And yes, once again, I'm going to bring up my school because this is an opportunity for new immigrants to this country to come and learn English. I hope it's the case for many, many years, and I hope that our country can get over using phrases like this to, to describe the people that we've invited to live here and to build a better life. Ms. Pry, what, uh, for the work you're doing in Colorado, what, what do Coloradans feel about these issues right now? Well, I've spent most of my time in France over the last year reporting on the war. Thank you for sending me. And I have to say, imbeciles and idiots look no further than Congress because it took, Col it took this country so long to enter this war. Colorado senator didn't even vote, avoided the vote. I have been in France. I have seen there are an estimated 200,000 French orphans. The devastation from this fighting, from these years of fighting, while Americans were sitting back, happy, worried about what this will mean for Colorado, our opportunities. What Europe faces when they must rebuild is beyond belief. The hunger in Belgium, the problems in France, it has truly been a catastrophic world war. And I want us all to think about what we need to do to help the people over there who've suffered so much. Back in office for a little over a year, Mayor Robert Speer has announced ambitious plans in his ongoing attempts to beautify Denver. From 1912 until 1916, citizens of Denver revolted against Speer. The general feeling at the time was citizens felt their tax dollars were going toward building fancy roads and parks for the mayor's developer friends projects. This year, a new Greek theater is going up in Civic Center Park. A new pavilion at Cheeseman Park is also under construction. As building progresses, some citizens are complaining the money would be better spent on fixing crumbling viaducts on 16th Street and 23rd Avenue. talk about Robert Spear, you're talking about a man with big ideas, but also a big ego, an ego to match. Uh, but I think what swept him back in is the citizen's good idea at first, a progressive idea, to replace the strong mayor with a commission form of government. Now, I came here uh, when, uh, when all that was going on, and I want to tell you that I think that the new charter that was put into place a few years back that brought Spear back to us is a good idea. But uh, Mayor Speer, he he's travels a lot, and he sees these things in other cities, and he wants to bring them here, and he wants to make us something that we're not. So I would like to see the mayor temper, temper those ambitions. Already, look at all the houses that people have lost in front of the Capitol for his big civic center idea. Uh, where have they gone? We don't know. We're losing them. We need to provide housing for people in this city because we're going to grow beyond these monuments uh, that, that Spear is forcing us. The biggest problem that I have with Boss Spear 
and we do call him boss, is the disruption that he caused in filling the Senate seat when our senator passed away a few years back, and the standoff, because he wanted that Senate seat, and Governor Alva Adams wanted that Senate seat, and as a result, we went two years, two years without two senators in the Congress. And I think that's a disgrace, and he ought to pay the price for it. Mr. Griffith, what does Denver need more of? More roads or more parks? Both. We need both for our citizens. And I think that's an interesting moment in our history right now to decide what is this city about? What will it become and who is it for? So on the one hand, I talk to my students and they're excited about projects, these grand ideas for parks and buildings connecting us to the mountains, to Evergreen, to Mount Evans, because that means jobs for them. But it also means that their housing prices are rising. It means the congestion on our roadways makes it almost impossible for them to get between their multiple jobs and then down to my school. So I hear all, both of those concerns. And as a city, we have to decide what is most important. Ultimately, I think an investment in our citizens is the biggest thing that we can do right. Ms. Pry, you've interviewed uh, Mayor Spear many times. How do you feel all these issues will be uh, finalized in, in the city of Denver? Roads, parks, investment, a lot at play. Well, there is no question that developers hold way too much power with Mayor Spear, but I imagine 100 years from now, people in Denver will be complaining that the developers have the mayor in, his, in their pockets. It has always been who gets the land, who gets the money, they build what they want, and the little people, the people who are uh, definitely benefiting from your school get left behind. I do agree with some of the City Beautiful concept. The area around um, Civic Center, what that will be the new Civic Center uh, Park, was definitely run down. The people who lived there were in unhygienic settings. We need to take care of these people. We need to make sure they have an education, they have hygiene, they have their health. But we do not need to make sure that developers can just keep fattening their bank accounts. Senator Shaproff, you're a fellow government official faced with decisions about roads and infrastructure and then parks and beautifying a city. What do you think of the decisions we've seen from Mayor Spear? Well, Bob Spear is a Democrat like me, but I'm a progressive and frugal Democrat, and he's a old machine bond dealer kind of Democrat. When I was governor for two terms, we faced these same kind of issues, and I said we want to make Colorado the playground of the world, and for that we need better roads. Well, I put the convicts in the state prison to work on building the roads, and I worked with the Good Roads Commission. So we did that without a big expense to the taxpayers. I cut, spe I cut spending all over, ordered our state agencies to stop lobbying the state legislature, because it's ridiculous for a taxpayer-paid employee to use the taxpayer's money to go to the legislature and lobby for more money for his agency. That, that's exactly backwards. Now, you can contrast that frugal approach, which worked in Colorado, got me the first re-election of any governor in our history, versus the Bob Spear approach. You look at his new city budget, $15,000 for the mayor's fund. What's going to get that going to be? $13,900 for the councilman's fund. Undoubtedly, more grease in the corrupt machinery of, of how Denver's being governed. Well, as we get together each week, we like to end our discussions with something looking back at the week or even the time we've had together. Let's start with what you felt was a disgrace, whether it was this week or even a little bit further in 1917. Ms. Pry, you always start off these discussions. What was your disgrace of this time? I'm afraid this will be a disgrace for years to come. The fact that women still do not have the vote. You know, in January, a thousand women gathered outside the White House and the, the Silent Sentinel to protest Women have been arrested for protesting, for not having the right to vote. I certainly am pushing as hard as I can. Many, many women in Colorado are pushing as hard as they can, but we do still do not have the right to vote. Senator. Well, I'd like to elaborate on, on that. I, I voted for the bill in Congress to, uh, to allow the territorial legislature of Hawaii to give women the vote. I've been a strong advocate for women's suffrage against the idea that there's some women's sphere made by God that they have to stay, and that's a sphere that's just an artificial construction made by man. And I was the lead sponsor of the bill in the latest Congress, uh, promoted by the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was not a perfect bill, but it would say any time 8% of the voters in a state sign a petition, then there has to be a referendum on women's suffrage in that state. It's not, I prefer we have media suffrage everywhere, but that was the best thing that we, we thought we might be able to pass. It didn't pass, and yet, 
I'm now getting, as a leading suffrage advocate, I'm getting attacked by Alice Paul and the National Women's Party, which are just so extreme that even the people who are their friends, if they don't get what they want yesterday, they're going to attack uh, their best friends and, and allies. Mr. Shea. Denver Tramway. You know, just last year they opened up that new Larimer Viaduct. They replaced the old one that was just streetcars. They built one that accommodates these automobiles. And I'll tell you what, downtown Denver already has seen a flood of automobiles. And if Denver Tramway isn't careful, they're going to see people preferring to take these new things. Not many people own them now, but I'll tell you what, they will have automobiles all over the streets of Denver in downtown, and it'll choke the place if they're not careful. Hey, Ms. Griffin. Recently, I saw an advertisement for a house near Cheeseman Park that was $6,000. If these prices continue, how will anyone live in central Denver? Hmm. Well, we love to end our discussion with something positive. So let's do something, let's say something nice about somebody. Ms. Pry. Well, I'm going to go outside of Colorado for this, up to Montana, which has sent the first woman to Congress, Jeanette Rankin. Congratulations, and let us hope there will be many more. Senator Shapiro. Rocky Mountain National Park was the record-setting national park last year, 1916, with 51,000 visitors. Mesa Verde National Park had its best year ever with over 1,300 visitors. A lot of the credit goes to the National Park's portfolio, which the Department of Interior published after I pushed them to do it, uh, to let people know about our, our great parks. Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Father. And as you know, Mother Cabrini, Mother Frances Cabrini, quite ill now. She's been active here in Denver for years, New York, Chicago, and other places. We pray for her recovery, uh, but she's the, uh, she's the Mother Cabrini who established the Queen of Heaven uh, Orphanage there in North Denver and the summer camp for, for girls up on Lookout Mountain. God bless her. There Get was well. recently a, a mass set of her name at Our Lady of Mark Carmel, so uh, many people are going to share those wishes. And Ms. Griffin. I'm obviously proud of my students, but I'd like to put their wares on display sometimes. This is a wonderful hat made by one of my students. So even if you don't want to take a, a course at my school, you can come and enjoy some of the goods provided by those students. I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this voice radio experiment with my students at the College of the Sacred Heart. I know they have found your takes on the important issues in 1917 very educational and valuable. I also want to thank my students listening back at our North Denver campus. On behalf of everyone here at our weekly discussion, thank you all for tuning in, and God bless. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling, you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, don't delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. And tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums, drums coming everywhere. So prepare.